Okay, everybody good? All right, here we go. Welcome to Off Script. This is NPR's series of conversations with Democratic primary candidates and local voters from across the country. I'm Michelle Martin. Today we are in El Paso, Texas with the former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke. Uh, he's also a former city council member and he represented this area in the Congress. This is the Texas 16th. Welcome. Actually, thank you for having us. No, thank you for being here and our gratitude to Ellen Jay for hosting us here in the restaurant. You picked this place. Tell me why it's important to you. You know, I came here as a kid with my folks, um, and it's also the place that we would bring friends for a great meal and uh, a beautiful part of El Paso and then some, some rich history. We're right next to Concordia Cemetery, and you've got John Wesley Hardin buried there. You have a former president of Mexico buried there, and it, and it helps to make the case that these two countries come together in this one community of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. So just rich tradition and history and also amazing food. So. Any special personal memories for you here? Anything special happen here? Mm. First kiss? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, just really actually coming here with my folks and um, family dinners here, kind of a special night out, get to come down to l j Cafe. Um, and then since then, as um, we're raising our kids. We bring them here. Mm -hmm. And then when we have visitors from out of town, we'll often bring them here to introduce them to the food, the cuisine of, of El Paso, Texas, sure. and the U.S.-Mexico border. Well, yeah. thanks for picking this place so that we of get course. to enjoy it as well. Let me introduce our voters. This is Connie Martinez. She is Hello. a first-time voter. And um, you're not at the age yet where I don't get to tell your age, right? You're 20. Yes, I'm okay, 20 years 20 old. 20 years old. And she's a student of, at the University of Texas at El Paso. Nice to meet you, Connie. Nice to meet you, too. Ruben Sandoval is here. He teaches social studies and civics at Coronado High School and El Paso Community College. They are both registered Democrats, and they tell us that they have not yet decided who they are going to support for the Democratic primary. So, so we're going to start with gun control or gun violence, I should say. I think mm -hmm. that's a subject that's on a lot of people's minds, certainly here in El Paso after the terrible events of August 3rd when a person killed uh, 22 people at, at the Walmart here. And I think Connie has a question about that. Yes, so, you know, after the shooting occurred, I just wanted to ask you, how did this affect you to want to have more gun reform, more so than in the past? I think being from here, hearing the news, not being able to believe it, um, not being able to accept that in this incredibly safe community, one of the safest in America, that 22 people would be killed, we later learned, in under three minutes, and, and many dozens more very badly injured. In fact, a little bit later today, I'm going to be visiting with uh, Jessica and Memo Garcia at Del Sol Hospital. He is having his 20th surgery, um, still not out of the hospital, still not out of, of harm's way. Listening to them, um, to Jessica, who was also shot, um, other survivors, people who have lost their children, lost their parents, lost a loved one. I just knew that we had to do everything that we possibly could to prevent this from happening again. And, and I also knew that what had been um, right before, uh, universal background checks, red flag laws, which stop somebody who owns a firearm, uh, if they pose a harm to themselves or someone else before it's too late, and ending the sale of weapons of war like the AK-47 that was used in El Paso. While all of that would be helpful, it would be insufficient as long as there were more than 10 million AK-47s and AR-15s out there on the streets, any one of which could be used as an instrument of terror, like that AK-47 was used in El Paso in the Walmart on August 3rd. And so I really do think just being with those families being an El Pasoan, um, listening to them, and, and having some of them say, you need to be our voice in this. And, and while there is still time, we need you to do the right thing. That forced me beyond whatever the polls said, whatever it did to our prospects in this election, whatever it means to me personally, forced me to, to say very clearly and honestly what this country needs. And that is in part a mandatory buyback of every AR-15, every AK-47 that's out there. So would it be accurate to say that you enhanced your policies or proposals after the shooting here, that you it actually changed your mind about some things? Would it, that be accurate? Absolutely. I think before I had been somewhat constrained by what I thought was politically possible. I thought, you know, the very edge of what we can do as a country is to end the sale of AR-15s and AK-47s. That is something that I said across Texas when I ran for Senate 
last year in every one of the 254 counties, having these really great conversations with gun owners and non-gun owners alike. And I, I thought that was the edge of what was possible. What's this Democrat in Texas doing talking about an assault weapons ban? But when I was really honest with myself, when, when people in this community forced me to be honest about the problem, I could not escape the conclusion that if these weapons are bad to sell, if we should ban their sale, then they should also be bought back if they pose a threat to people in this community. And I cannot tell you how many people in El Paso, your age and younger, tell me that they feel like they're walking around with a target on their back. We know that killer came to El Paso. He mm -hmm. told police to kill Mexicans, uh, posted a manifesto warning of an invasion that he sought to repel, feared as a white man that he was going to be replaced by Hispanics and those who are immigrating from Latin America. So for this community, for this country, for the, the sake of doing the right thing while we can, I wanted to make sure that I clearly laid out what I think this country needs to do if we're going to save the lives of our fellow Connie, Americans. Connie, do you have a follow-up for the congressman about that? I do, actually. So I think that's all really great because I completely agree with you. I know that we need gun reform, and what happened in El Paso was a complete tragedy to myself included. Um, but how do you plan to do this? Like, What kind of plans, what kind of reform do you have? How would you get the opposing side to agree to participate in the buyback program. Can I ask about that? Let me follow up on that comment, yeah. if, I, if you don't mind me backing you up on this one. No, you're fine. Um, because the congressman has a very robust plan on his website. I mean, yes. he has a very detailed plan on his website. But I think the second part of Connie's question is important, which is how do you persuade people who are, who are not already persuaded like she is. And I want to go back to what you said at the September debate where you said, hell yes, we're coming for your AR-15s. You won the moment. You won the moment. But in some ways, did you hurt the cause? Because you just got people's backs up. I mean, you can tell that people are already fundraising on this. A, a state rep said, basically dared you to come get his gun. Mm -hmm. So what about it? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. The, the day after that debate, I was still in the Houston area and a gentleman stopped me in a convenience store and he said, look, Beto, I'm as Republican as they come. I own an AR-15. I will likely never vote for a Democrat, including you. But what you said on that debate stage last night is exactly how I feel and precisely what I think this country needs to do. I don't need my AR-15 to hunt. I don't need it for self-protection in my home. Uh, it's fun to shoot at, at the range, but I agree, this is part of, of the problem, and I would gladly sell it back. I'm just so surprised that anyone had the guts to actually say this. When I talked to families who lost a loved one in, in gun violence, and we were just in Denver, um, listening to families who had lost a loved one in the Aurora movie theater shooting, for example, they also said, I, I'm so surprised that you said what has been on our minds and in our hearts and what we had hoped somebody would say, but feared that no one would, would ever utter, especially on a debate stage while they're running for president. What I found from that gentleman in, in Houston, Texas, that Republican, the families in Denver, is that the political will is there. And they just polled, actually, in Texas last week, found that 49% of people in our state, this proud, but I would argue responsible gun-owning state, believe in a mandatory assault weapon buyback. Only 36% of Texans, this okay. is Texas, oppose that. So um, to your question, Michelle, I, I really think the, the public sentiment is there. The popular will is there. It's just looking for leadership that will reflect that. Okay. I think we provided that. Ruben, you have a follow-up on that? Uh, I do. Um, first of all, I want to thank NPR for giving me the opportunity to speak yeah. uh, with everyone here. And uh, before I begin anything, I want to give a shout out to my students at uh, Coronado High School and El Paso Community College. Duly noted. Thank you. Shout thank out. You. Hey, hi. <laughs> hi, guys. Okay, go for it. And uh, as you know, one of the courses that I teach, I teach Texas government and also state and local government, uh, both at Coronado and EPCC. So we kind of discuss these issues uh, as far as the Second Amendment and the limits on the Second Amendment. Um, and I remember what you said on the stage as far as... Uh, uh, um, the buyback pro program, the mandatory buy buyback program. Um, the question I have is, how would you get around the Supreme Court rulings? I mean, you've got the D.C. versus Heller, uh, which uh, it began to federalize or actually applied it to D.C., the Second Amendment, and then you have the McDonald versus Chicago, which basically said that the Second Amendment is incorporated to all states. Mm. And so it would seem as though the courts would probably rule against something banning the AK-47, the AR-15s, mm. And a mandatory uh, buyback program would seem to be deemed to be unconstitutional. And as late as 2016, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals also included 
assault rifles to be part of the arms that are protected by the Second Amendment. So, How would you be able to get around that? Yeah, in fact, your colleague, uh, Congressman Cuellar, who uh, represents, you know, the districts that sit in the middle of the state going up to, yeah. and, you know, we talked to him about this the other day. He's a Democrat. I mean, it's true he has an A rating from the NRA, but he says that the his understanding is that the Constitution doesn't discriminate among weapons. So, to Ruben's point, of, of course, the, the Constitution discriminates uh, amongst weapons, and you have no lesser conservative light than former Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who made the case that the Second Amendment, like every co constitutional guarantee and right, is not unlimited. You couldn't drive a tank, for example, down the street under the Second Amendment or shoulder a bazooka. Yes. Um, this AR-15 or, or AK-47, these weapons were designed engineered, sold to the militaries of the world for use on a battlefield. They're, they're excellent at killing people efficiently, effectively, in as great a number as possible. In under three minutes in a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, 22 people were killed. When the Second Amendment was adopted and, and ratified, it took three minutes to reload your musket. I don't know that the founding fathers, the framers of the Constitution, those who pursued that Second Amendment and got it ratified could have envisioned uh, a weapon designed for war, for use on a battlefield, whose high impact, high velocity round, when it, when it hits your body, it expends all of its kinetic energy inside of you to destroy your insides. And I've met with the trauma surgeons at Del Sol and UMC, many of whom have served at William Beaumont Army Medical Center and have been deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. They say these are wounds of war. Congressman, with all due treating. respect, I don't think that answers the question. I think everybody understands your passion about the issue, but the question is, with the conservative courts, not just the conservative Supreme Court, and conservative lower courts, yeah. which has been an intentional uh, project of the Republicans in Congress for years, uh, how what, what do you the get question? around is, is the, the understanding? Question, is the question whether or not this is constitutional? Yes. My answer is yes, and I just made the case. Oh. Is the question, should we not pursue public policy or legislation for fear of the current composition of the courts? My answer to that is no. Do the right thing while you have time to do the right thing. And I think every American understands the distinction between a hunting rifle or a shotgun or a handgun that you have in your home for self-defense and something that was designed and is devastatingly effective at doing it to kill people on a battlefield. That is what an AR-15 and an AK-47 is. As, as we now know, the majority of America supports this proposal, a plurality of Texans in what is thought to be a very red and certainly a very proud gun-owning state support this proposal as well. So I, I know that this is the right thing to do. I know America supports this. You have a very good question about what is its fate uh, when it is challenged in the courts of law. We don't know. Um, but, but fear of that uncertainty shouldn't prevent us from doing the right thing for all of those Americans whose lives we want to save in a country that loses 40,000 people a year to gun violence. No other country comes close. Do we feel ready to move on to health care? Because I know that's another question. I just have. want to do a follow-up. Uh, and quick and quick I agree follow with you uh, okay. uh, that uh, fear should not be the motivating factor on our uh, public policy. Uh, but I guess what I wanted to add was perhaps maybe a more gradual approach uh, with uh, is, uh, addressing the issue of assault rifles. For example, like maybe moving the age up to 21 rather than 18. Uh, or uh, the stranger, the stranger background checks, mm. which is something that Lieutenant uh, uh, Dan Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, has now supported, despite the fact that he had a hundred percent rating from the NRA. Uh, you seem that some of these Republicans who we see as very conservative, actually moving on the issue. So I would think that a more gradual approach might be the more effective way to perhaps reduce the type of violent incidents like we had at Walmart. Uh, the Odessa shooting was, uh, as you know, that person uh, purchased the gun despite failing the background check was able right. to get it through the stranger to stranger sales. Can, I, can I stop you, Ruben? Sure. Why do you ask that? Is it because you didn't find the congressman's answer satisfying? Or you no, felt no. that, are you worried that the proposals he's laid out just aren't realistic? Why do you ask that question? I, I feel that um, if taking that position would probably only embolden the other side to use it as a talking point okay. to say that we're... Democrats are going to destroy the Second Amendment. Democrats are coming for your guns and so on. So okay. to me, a more gradual approach would be more effective okay, let's to have, see let's, and, yeah. and shift the mood of the country in that direction. Let's let him answer that. That's go ahead. It. It's, go ahead. So, so Ruben, I think many of the proposals that, that you just laid out, um, like closing all the loopholes in the background check system right now, gun show loopholes, stranger to stranger loophole, the boyfriend loophole, the Charleston loophole, all these different ways that you can buy a gun without having your background checked to ensure that we keep 
keep our fellow Americans safe. Let's do that. And, and let's not do that to the exclusion of doing anything else. If we can get red flag laws, if we can stop the sale of assault weapons, if we can have a registry for all the guns owned and licensing for anyone who wants to own a firearm, and then if we can, if we can buy back those assault weapons that are out there, let's do it. And, and we don't have to do it in an all or nothing um, proposition. I think whatever progress we can achieve, we should seize it the moment that we can. But I do think we have to define what the goal is and what we know will make America safer. And that's what I'm trying to do with, with our proposal and really reflect what I've been hearing on the ground from groups like March for Our Lives, which has come out with a very bold proposal to bring peace to, to America. And as you all know, this is an organization started by students, not unlike your students at Coronado, who survived uh, gun violence in, in their school and then wanted to make sure that they were able to lead effective policy and political changes, including in Florida, raising the age of purchase from 18 to 21. They're, they're already being able to notch some victories. And, and none of those victories is exclusive to the other policies that they're pursuing. So I, I like your question, and I think that is possible. Let's move to health care, because I know that's also an issue that interests you and concerns you. You have a question about health care costs, as I understand it. Yes. Okay. So with the affordable hair, uh, the ACA, um, instead of things becoming more affordable, it seems like they've gotten more expensive, especially in the area of uh, prescription medications. And I've had uh, close family members uh, who, uh, with the changes, it uh, seems as though the medication that they so uh, uh, need, uh, they're not able to get it, or the copay is just extremely high. And so I know that the ACA essentially exempted the pharmaceutical companies and let them unregulated. So how would you address uh, this issue? Because it seems that politicians have been talking about this for a long time. Because yes, I mean, the Affordable Care Act was supposed to lower our premiums, but the cost was shifted to the prescriptions. And so being a border community, as you know very well here, mm -hmm. uh, so many of us have to cross into Juarez, uh, Mexico, in order to get our prescriptions at a lower cost. Because even though we have insurance, the cost is still too high. And so why is uh, Americans, who we have to cross into Juarez, which by the way is a very dangerous city, and and the traffic on the, on the lines could be uh, pretty horrendous. Uh, why can't we get it through our own insurance? I mean, um, and again, with the medications that were needed, sometimes not even the generics are offered. So it seems that uh, this was a, a massive loophole, talking about loopholes, that was left in the ACA. And I'm glad you raised it because everybody doesn't have the option of going to Juarez to get, however inconvenient, to get cheaper prices. And in fact, it isn't just prescription prices that are going up. We just have data this week saying that the premiums, even for people covered by private insurance, are at an all-time high. So the question is, you heard it, what is your plan to bring down these out-of-pocket costs? I think we first need to look at why it's so expensive to purchase medication or to pay your premium or afford your copay or bridge your deductible right now. A lot of that has to do with the current administration undermining the Affordable Care Act and trying to remove protections, remove subsidies. We've seen extraordinary inflation over the last three years in all the cases that you described. But specific to the pharmaceutical industry, this is a challenge that pre-existed the Trump administration. Our Congress prevented Medicare by law from using its leverage and, and its purchasing power to drive down the cost to bargain for lower prescription medication costs. If we were to do that, not only would Medicare beneficiaries realize gains, but so would Medicaid, VA, TRICARE, and private insurance beneficiaries as well. And this is particularly galling because you and I as taxpayers pay for the research and development that goes into discovering these cures. We pay for the clinical trials. We pay for the purchase through all the programs that, that I just described. And yet they're sold back to us at some of the most expensive rates, if not the most expensive rates on the planet today. So our proposal, allow Medicare to, to use its leverage to bargain for lower costs. Allow Americans to buy in Mexico or Canada or the European Union as long as we have the same level of quality and due diligence for the, the medications that are sold. If you can find them cheaper somewhere else, then you should be allowed by law to purchase them. But removing the immunity and impunity with which pharmaceutical corporations can act, um, the way that they've gamed the system by using PAC donations and lobbyists to purchase the complicity of members of Congress, not just influence, not just access, but outcomes like those that we've described. We've got to stop that. Our campaign does not take 
PAC money or corporate or special interest support. As president, I would seek to uh, end that practice altogether for anyone seeking or holding federal office in this country. It goes a long way to ensure that I'm listening to you and not to a, an executive at a corporation. Uh, lastly, um, you're right, in the ACA, there, there were carve-outs and sweetheart deals uh, for people like the uh, pharmacy benefits managers who have done really well under the ACA, added additional cost, uh, inflated price without providing a tremendous amount of value. Uh, our plan, which is called Medicare for America, would get to universal guaranteed high quality health care for every American, allowing those who are uninsured today to enroll in Medicare, those insufficiently insured, can't afford that copay to choose to enroll in Medicare, and then those who have employer-sponsored insurance, including members of unions who fought for it, are able to keep it if it works for them and works for their families, and we would eliminate copays on pharmaceutical medications so that you can focus on teaching that class, living to your full potential, fulfilling your promise, and not the, the, the red tape or the cost connected to modern day healthcare in America. Connie, do you wanna get in this? Cause I sure do. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, of course. So obviously since I am only 20, I'm still very dependent on my family, but I do agree with you, Ruben, where it's been very difficult for people of the working class, people who are educated to, you know, go to the doctor, something as simple where, you know, even in my personal life, it's like, oh, I can't go to the doctor for a while until, you know, money comes in because it does get so expensive. So I think it's really interesting about your plan for health care and to help the working class, but also all levels of them. So I guess what my question would be to propose to you is, what, what is like the laid out plan? Like if you could just elaborate on your plan as president, if elected. Yeah. So can I just ask Connie a question? You're saying you can't go to the doctor. Why? Because the co-pays are too high. The co-pays are too high. You know, so even though you have insurance, you yes. still find yourself hesitating to go to the doctor and there's been when times. you need to go because because the out of pocket costs are still yes, too the high. The out of pocket cost is too high. The insurance doesn't cover enough where, you know, even though I don't know if you guys could tell, but I have braces and there's times where it's a battle of do I go to the doctor or do I you know, eat for the next week. And mm. it's just very difficult because, you know, my family is educated. My mother's a teacher. My father uh, works as well. And even though we're not in the low income classes or anything, there's times where we're making sacrifices that shouldn't really be happening with everything that they've done for us. Well, thanks for letting me get in your business. No, no, you're um, fine. Because, because Congressman, this is, the, this is the question that has come up over and over again on, on the debate stage. Mm. Uh, and that a lot of people are interested in. The people who say that they support single payer, they say they support single payer because they say that's the only way that you get the economies of scale, that you get the bargaining power to cover everything that needs to be covered, like braces, like hearing aids, and still be able to pay for it because it eliminates the red tape. They say that it eliminates the, and obviously people dispute that. Obviously there's been a huge and aggressive fight about that. But the reality of it is you're saying you want a dual system. And the question is, you know, how do you pay for that? How do you bring the costs down? Mm. How do you bring the cost down to, how do you bring down our overall societal expenses? Because as you well know, this country is paying more as a bigger percentage of its GDP for healthcare than most of our peer economies, and the outcomes are worse. So the question is, how do you, how do you with your dual system get the objective that we're looking for here? Mm. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up cost because it's not an inexpensive proposition to guarantee everyone in this country health care, primary health care, prescription medication health care, mental health care in a state whose largest provider of mental health care is the county jail system right now, reproductive health care so that every person can make their own decisions about their own body and have health care that allows them to do that. But far more expensive than doing that is the status quo. It costs us $110 to lock someone up who for their schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or clinical depression, literally in Texas, gets arrested on purpose. And this is not an uncommon thing. It's not right, it's immoral, it's unconscionable, but it's happening in this state. For a fraction of the cost, we could provide world-class outpatient mental health care, either through an employer-sponsored health care plan or 
a Medicare for America plan that, that, that we've described where if you're uninsured or cannot afford your co-pays today, you can enroll in that program and not have to worry about a copay every time you go to the doctor or to the therapist or to a family planning provider. That way you're focused on fulfilling your potential, learning in your classes, achieving your goals, creating for your family, your community, and your country. And the return on that initial investment is far and away greater than what we would spend as taxpayers or spend as a country. And, and Michelle, to your point, with much better results. We spend more than any other country per capita in the world right now in healthcare, but we do not have the best results. In fact, in some communities, some people are seeing declining uh, life expectancy in America. Even as technology improves, new medications are created, we have to do better. And under our plan, we will. How, tell me how the arithmetic works, though. Are you saying that bringing more people into your Medicare for, um, Medicare for America plan will do what? I mean, how does it increase the, how does it decrease the overall costs? Because it seems to me you still have two dual administrative systems, one for private insurance and one for the publicly funded option that you're talking about. So how does that bring costs down overall? When tens of millions of Americans are now able to go to a doctor and don't receive their care on an emergency basis in the ER, when those with mental health care challenges are able to see a therapist or psychologist or a psychiatrist instead of getting arrested on purpose, we as taxpayers save in the billions of dollars when you look at this over the next 10 to 20 years. You're right. Private insurance has a higher administrative cost, something like 16% compared to Medicare's 2%. We envision that most of the millions of our fellow Americans who are uninsured today will enroll in Medicare. And that's, that's a saving over private insurance. But I also want to make sure that I'm listening to our fellow Americans, tens of millions of them, many of the members of unions who fought for health care plans that they like, that work for them and their families, if they want to keep them, I want them to be able to make the choice to be able to do that. And yes, o over the long term, this country saves, this country produces better health care outcomes, this country's economy, when people are no longer tied to their jobs because you can elect to leave your employer-sponsored insurance and enroll in Medicare. They're free to work that next job, start a business, um, go teach school, wh whatever it is that they were placed on this planet to do in the first place. They're now well enough to be able to do that. Okay, and but some of your competitive, some of your fellow Democratic candidates have identified specific funding streams. They say there's particularly Elizabeth Warren, she says specifically a tax on the highest earners. You're not prepared to identify yes. a specific funding source for this? Sure I am. Um, if, if we took a corporate tax rate that under the $2 trillion Trump tax cuts, the benefits of which flowed to corporations, flowed to the very wealthiest in this country, if we took that corporate tax rate that had dropped from 35 to 21%, back up just to 28%, we would generate hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years. If we were to tax returns on capital at the same rate that we tax ordinary wage income, the, the income that is being earned by our server here at, at L&J, we would generate hundreds of billions of dollars. And yes, if we were to add a transactions tax on, on Wall Street transactions, a wealth tax to address the fact that you have the greatest divide in wealth inequality in this country's history right now in 2019, not only would we generate the revenue to be able to pay for these programs, we would also address something that is a threat to our democracy and a threat to everyone in this country being able to see a future for themselves and their kids in this country. So yes, we can pay for this and those are the streams that we would look at. Okay, Ruben, I know you have some other questions and I know you were, when we were talking earlier, you were concerned about the federal judiciary, am I right? Of course, and do you wanna ask a question about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to address, what kind of gets lost in the conversation among the various uh, candidates running for president is a conversation about the Supreme Court, and, uh, but also the lower courts as well. And uh, I referenced an NPR story where um, a few months ago they were mentioning that the Trump administration has been very much on focus, uh, on point as far as the appointees are put on the court, and something like 25% of the federal judges on the circuit courts have been appointed by uh, the Trump administration, about 15% of the district courts. And if you include the two Supreme Court uh, appointees, uh, Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, that actually makes up 22% mm. of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
And so my question really, I mean, obviously decisions like Citizens United, which I know you've spoken out against, and this is what has caused the massive amounts of money that makes it very hard to fight the NRA or the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but one of the things that's been lost is this uh, right to privacy. So uh, in my mm -hmm. class, I teach about civil liberties. And so to me, right to privacy is a very fundamental right. And uh, most of the discussion is around abortion and things of that sort, but mm -hmm. it encompasses so much more. Uh, when we talk about reproductive rights, we're also talking about access to birth control, uh, but it also affects LGBT rights. I mean, there's a number of rights that really fall under the umbrella of the right to privacy. So, and uh, so, I, so my question is, how would we uh, maybe persuade the public or edify the public to maybe support uh, appointees who will defend that right? Because what happens is as these people are, are given very narrow questions, but really are never right, made to answer something as fundamental as a right to privacy. Well, can, I, can I just amplify mm -hmm. Ruben's sure. question here a little bit? Because the, the reality of it is the Trump administration has already put its stamp on the federal judiciary. So what can you do? So For makes, those who don't agree, I mean, obviously, if you agree with the direction that the Republicans in the Senate and the Trump administration has taken, you're fine. But if you, like Rubin, do not, what options do you really have, even if you are elected president? Yeah, it's, it's part of what makes this election so important. You're absolutely right, Rubin. President Trump has been very successful in being able to stack these courts, to, to be successful in having his nominees confirmed at, at all levels of the federal judiciary. Imagine if he had another four years within which to do that. So as president, uh, I will make sure that we nominate justices who believe in a woman's right to choose, who believe in the full civil rights of every American. And we say this from a state where it is legal, though it's not okay, but it is legal to fire somebody based on their sexual orientation. Supreme Court justices and, and federal judiciary nominees who agree that money is not speech, corporations are not people, and corporations should not be able to spend as much money as they want to influence the outcomes of election. You reference Citizens United, which has done lasting damage to this democracy and ultimately must be overturned. But you also talked about our, our right to privacy, and this is something that we are uh, acutely sensitive to here in El Paso, where our Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure really have been suspended because of our location on the border. We have Border Patrol checks well into the interior of the U.S. Even if you have not been in Ciudad Juarez earlier today, you will be stopped. You'll be asked to, to show your papers. Um, you, you have a different expectation of privacy in this country. When you add to that the challenges that we have in a digital economy, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, we need to be far more vigorous in being able to protect our privacy, our photos, our information, our relationships, uh, our data. And, and as president, I will make that a priority, both through the legislation that we pursue. Uh, I'll set up a, a new office of di digital markets regulation and have a regulator who will jealously defend your rights, but we'll also make sure that this is a criteria for how we choose those that we nominate to federal benches. You know who really gets a say on judges? The Senate. That's right. Which leads some people to wonder, why aren't you running for the Senate where the Democrats could use your help right away? I'm running for president. I want to lead this country. I want to provide what we're so sorely missing right now, someone who will heal instead of inflame, someone who bring this country together instead of further dividing us as President Trump does every day, and someone who sees the greatest challenges that we've ever faced, climate change, where we have 10 years within which to act, or wars that we have been fighting for 18 years without end, without a definition of victory, without a strategy that is understood by this country, that we can turn those around and see those as our greatest opportunities to make sure that we pursue the future for this country and really for the world confidently, courageously, ambitiously, defined by our aspirations and our ambitions and not our fears, not our smallness, not the weakness in walls and cages for kids that we see right now. And, and I'll say this, Michelle, if I were the nominee, not only could I win the 38 electoral college votes in Texas, which would decisively decide that election in November of 2020. So there is no open question that the president can exploit to try to question the outcome of that election. But we can also help the nominee for U.S. Senate against John Cornyn. We can do everything that we need to all up and down the ballot here in Texas. And there are a number of extraordinary candidates who are pursuing that nomination for Senate right now. I, and so I, I have no fear that we'll be able to win. I think the argument 
would be the opposite, that there are a number of candidates who can do what you're proposing to do as president, but there are actually very few people who can win a, a, a Senate seat in Texas because you came so close. So I think the question for a lot of people is, first of all, you didn't win your first run for the Senate. What's your path to the presidency? What makes you so sure you can win those electoral college votes for Texas in a presidential campaign. I mean, what's your path at this point? Yeah, so I, I think last year gave us a preview of that path. Though we were running in what was thought to be one of the reddest states in the union, won more votes than any Democrat had previously. Importantly, to your question, we won independence for the first time in decades, and nearly half a million Republicans also voted for us and voted for a Republican for governor on the same ballot, not despite maybe because of a very progressive agenda. And that was in a midterm in a state that before 2018 ranked 50th in voter turnout in America. Young voter turnout during the early voting part of the election 2018 was up 500%. So that coalition, that movement of young people, of independents, of disaffected Republicans, of an energized Democratic base is how we were able to post those outcomes in Texas. It's the kind of coalition and movement we will need to defeat Donald Trump in November of 2020 and then bring this very divided country back but together But you do again. see the fear that a number of Democrats express that the candidates like yourself who aren't polling very high are diverting money and resources from that central task. And you see that that fear kind of starting to turn into hostility, in fact. Like, yeah. why are you right. still here when oh. we could be focusing, you could be focusing your efforts on that central task? So uh, how do you answer that? I say have no fear. We, we are many months from the Iowa caucus. And are we going to allow pollsters and pundits and polls today to determine that outcome? Or are we going to allow those in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, Texas on Super Tuesday to make the choice for themselves and by extension for this country. We both know the history of presidential primary polling and the candidates who were in the single digits at this time uh, in their given presidential um, election pursuit. Um, I so think he's throwing shade at the news media. I'm kind of feeling a little shade <laughs> being thrown here. Trying to do it diplomatically that. and tactfully, I'm but but okay. um, no, th right. this well, this is this is the opportunity. That, that we have, and, and perhaps better than any other candidate that is out there, I have shown an ability to bring people in despite the differences, differences of party, differences of geography, any difference that is before us that cannot be allowed to divide us at a time of extraordinary opportunity and extraordinary challenge for this country. So well, I do have to ask you some political questions. I'm going to sure. beg your indulgence on that. I mean, uh, what the, obviously the very big story of the moment uh, coming out of Washington, D.C., is the impeachment inquiry. Uh, do you support it? Do you think it's the right thing to do at the right time? I do now. I did when I was asked more than two years ago by a conservative radio host in Lubbock, Texas, while I was pursuing um, the, the Senate election in, in Texas, because if we allow this president to commit crimes with impunity, then we will have set a precedent in America that some people are above the law. And the moment we do that is the moment that we lose this democracy, this extraordinary experiment that is the exception, not the rule, in world history and on the planet today. And for the sake of my kids, for every generation that follows, for this country that I love so much, we cannot allow that to happen. And so impeachment is the right course to pursue. Do you have any concerns that Joe Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden, has been... Um damaged by this inquiry, even though there's zero evidence that he's done anything wrong. But there is a question about whether his son should have taken uh, such a high profile position in a Ukrainian company at a time when his father was vice president, even though there's zero evidence that any laws were broken, that has to be said. But are you at all concerned that Joe Biden himself has been damaged by this? No concern whatsoever. As you just mentioned, there is no evidence that the vice president has done or had done anything wrong. I, I think the focus has to remain on the president, his willful law breaking, um, the impunity he's enjoyed so far for doing that, the circle of enablers in the US Senate, his attorney general, and others who are allowing this to happen, the US Congress at this point, uh, and the people that they represent are the last best defense for our democracy. So I'm going to stay focused on, on the person, Donald Trump, who's committed these crimes and the need for this country to rise to the challenge. And what do you say to people who say that because Democrats like yourself have staked out that position for so long, they've prejudged the matter and that the inquiry is basically just a cover for what they wanted to do all along, which is remove him from office because they felt he's illegitimate. I mean, is there anything that you think Democrats should be doing to assure Republican voters 
or people who are just undecided that the, the conclusion is not foregone, that this really is a fair inquiry. It has to transcend what is good or bad for the Democratic Party. This has to be about what is good for this country. And when you have a president who called for the involvement of a foreign power as a candidate, and he did it in 2016, who sought to cover up, obstruct justice, and lie to investigators as he did in 2017, 2018, and 2019, and now has enlisted the aid of yet another foreign power, President Zelensky of Ukraine, holding out $400 million in U.S. aid to get him to dig up dirt on a prospective political opponent. If we don't call this for what it is, if we're not honest with ourselves and the American public, then we will have condoned this behavior, and we are complicit in the outcome, which is the loss of this democracy. And we cannot allow this to happen. This is a moment that calls for country over party. And so let's stay focused on this okay. country. Any other questions for the congressman? We only have a couple of minutes left, especially if you have any fun questions. Do you have any fun questions? Fun questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a pretty pressing question okay, that go ahead. I've been go wanting to ask you in regards of immigration. Leave nothing and on the table. I, go for it, Connie. I'm just so passionate about immigration and my entire life I've just grown up Hispanic. But my question for you is what are you going to do about the families that have been separated? I know that's been very controversial with President Trump, but I think that if you are elected, that is something that needs to be addressed not only immediately, but diligently. And how would you do that? I, I have been here in El Paso at Annunciation House, this extraordinary Catholic charity in our community that has helped to facilitate the reunification of families that have been separated. And, and what I've seen on, on the face of that eight-year-old child who's seeing her mother for the first time in months is, is not a big smile the way my eight-year-old greets me when I come home off the road from traveling, not tears of joy. You see nothing, uh, a complete vacant expression, an inability, I think, to connect with the person with whom you associate the greatest pain and suffering a child can possibly endure. And I, I say that to, to make it clear that we are doing lasting damage and trauma to these children. We, we are torturing them every day that they're separated for their parents. So for that reason, day one as president of the United States, we will spare no expense in finding the parents of those kids, even if they're in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, wherever they are in the world, and reuniting them with their children, and then making sure that we help them with the long-term therapy and recovery to address the trauma that we have placed them in. We should also mention that we've lost the lives of seven children just over the course of the last year who are in our custody and care due to these very inhumane policies at the border from Donald Trump. So let's do that first and foremost. Agree that we will never separate another family, cage another kid, incarcerate anyone seeking shelter or refuge or asylum in this country, and then do the larger work of rewriting this country's immigration laws in our own image. And I would love to start with the image of El Paso, a city of immigrants and the sons and daughters of immigrants that is one of the safest cities in the United States of America, and safe not despite that, but because we are that city of immigrants connected to the rest of the world. Nothing to be defensive for or apologize for, everything to celebrate the example for the rest of the country, and we'd love to work with you, Connie, on being able to do that. Well, thank you for that, Connie. Thank you for your question. I have two quick questions. Do you have a hype song before you go out to debate? <laughs> um, you know, I, I love The Clash. Um, I love the song um, Clamp Down by The Clash or anything off the, the London Calling album. So that, that's a good pump-up song. You, you, you play you it go. before you go out there? To... Sometimes. Uh, played also uh, Baba O'Reilly uh, by The Who uh, off the album <laughs> Who's Next. I don't know if, you, if you've heard it well before my time and your time. I was going to say, I you're have. dating yourself there. But, I'm, but gonna, I'm, just, I'm not classic. even going to. I actually have it on vinyl. Do you? you do? <laughs> do you have it on vinyl? Right on. Nice. Yeah. Okay. One of the best songs ever. And my final question is, what should we order here? Um, the green chili chicken enchiladas are absolutely amazing. You, you cannot go wrong if you order that. Okay. That is <laughs> Congressman Beto O'Rourke. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Really also, thanks it. to our voters, Connie Martinez and Ruben Sandoval. Thank you thank all you so much. much. Thank you. This is Off Script from NPR News. I'm Michelle Martin. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you once thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Connie. Thanks, Ruby. That was a terrible Wednesday. It was fun. Yeah, it was good. No, it was great.